Hi, Steve here, blessedhopeforever.com. Kind of hard to talk about the rapture uh, without talking about signs of the times, or without uh, talking about timing, seems to be a really big part of it. However, did you know that the first theory associated with the translation of the church or the rapture of the church is not concerned with the time of the translation in relation to the tribulation period, but rather with the subjects to be translated. It's contended that not all believers will be taken at the rapture, but rather only those who are watching and waiting for that event to occur, who have reached some degree of spiritual attainment that makes them worthy to be included. This view has been held by many Christians for many, many years. But there are not a few, some of them deep and, and prayerful students of the scriptures, uh, honest, sincere students of God's word, who believe that only a prepared and ex expectant section of believers will be translated. They believe that a clear inference from Luke 21, Luke chapter 21, is that those Christians who do not watch will not escape all these things that shall come to pass. And they will not be accounted worthy to stand before the Son of Man. They gather from such passages as Philippians 3.20, Titus 2.13, uh, 2 Timothy 4.8, Hebrews 9.28, that those only will be taken who wait, look for, and have loved his appearing. The doctrinal difficulties of this theory, which we call the partial rapture theory, the partial rapture position, it rests on certain misunderstandings of the doctrines of Scripture. The partial rapturist, dearly beloved, position is based on a misunderstanding of the value of the death of Christ as it frees the sinner from condemnation and renders him acceptable to God. This doctrine is bound up in three New Testament words, propitiation, reconciliation, and redemption. Here is what we know. Christ, by having his own blood sprinkled, as it were, over his body at Golgotha, becomes the mercy seat in reality. He is the propitiator, and he's made propitiation by answering the just demands of God's holiness against sin. And so, heaven is propitiated this fact and it is a fact of propitiation is to is for us to believe we're to believe this it is the godward side of the work of christ 
on the cross. The death of Christ in our place. God is fully satisfied. So when we're discussing this whole idea of a, of a partial rapture theory, it can't even be discussed apart from the, the plain doctrines of Scripture. You know, there are many, many Christians, I've met them, that are just afraid of the Lord coming back because they just don't think they're ready. It really breaks my heart. These are God's children. They love Him. Reconciliation is, you know, means that it's someone or something is thoroughly changed and adjusted to something which is a standard. You know, just like a watch might be adjusted to a chronometer. By the death of Christ on its behalf, we are changed, thoroughly changed, as far as our relationship to God is concerned. Altered in our position. You know, uh, our minds, uh, you know, concerning the, God's judgments uh, uh, through the cross, that, that Christ is, that he, God's not going to exact twice punishment, okay? He would be unjust. Either your judgment fell on Christ or it falls on you, one or the other. One or the other. There's, there's no gray area here. I've, uh, on many occasions, been given the opportunity to talk about, uh, in the past, I've, I've been asked to talk about this these positions, you know, uh, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, partial trib, which is what I'm kind of laying on you now. I've done several videos in the past concerning this subject. I think the timing is, it's fair to say it's good timing, given what I think that we've all been looking at and watching uh, occur around us for several years now redemption is an act of god by which he he himself pays as a, as a ransom the price of human sin which the outraged holiness and government of god requires it was done on our behalf christ did it it undertakes the solution of the problem of sin as as reconciliation undertakes the solution of the problem of the sinner and propitiation undertakes the problem of an offended God. A partial rapture theory is just plain foolish. Divine redemption is by blood, the ransom price, and by power. And, and the result of that threefold work is a, is a perfect salvation by which the sinner is justified, he's made acceptable to God, he's been placed in Christ positionally to be received by God as though he were Jesus Christ himself. Believe it or not, the individual who has this perfect standing of Christ can never be less than completely acceptable to God the uh, partial rapturist who insists that only those who are waiting and watching will be raptured, folks, minimizes the perfect standing of the child of God in Christ and presents him before the Father in his own experimental righteousness. So the sinner then must be less than justified less than perfect in Christ. It's not all the partial rapturist does. He, he must deny the New Testament teaching on the unity of the body of Christ according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. All believers are, all 
believers are united to the body of which Christ is the head. Ephesians 5. This baptizing experience is true of every regenerated individual. If the rapture includes only a portion of those redeemed, then the body of which Christ is the head will be dismembered and dis disfigured. It'll, it'll be a dismembered, disfigured body when it's taken to him. The building of which he is the chief cornerstone will be incomplete. The priesthood of which he is the high priest will be without a portion of its complement. The bride in relation to whom he is the bridegroom will be disfigured. The new creation of which he is the head will be incomplete. And these things are impossible to imagine. The partial rapturist must deny the completeness of the resurrection of the believers at the rapture. Since not all the living saints could be raptured, logically, not all the dead in Christ could be resurrected. You know, in, in the sense that as, you know, many of them died in spiritual immaturity. But since Paul teaches that we shall all be changed and that all those that sleep in Jesus will God bring, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it is impossible to admit a partial resurrection. The partial rapturous confuses the scriptural teaching on rewards. You know, the uh, rewards are graciously given by God as the, as the recompense for faithful service. The New Testament is very clear in its teaching about rewards. Revelation chapter 2, James 1, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, Philippians 4, just to name a few verses. 2 Timothy 4.8 Nowhere in its teaching about rewards is the rapture included as a reward for watching. You know, if you're teaching that, then that would make rewards a legal obligation on the part of God rather than a gracious gift. The partial rapturist, he confuses the distinction between law and grace. Very common error. If, if his view is correct, the believer's position before God eternally would depend on his works for what he did and what attitudes he developed. Would, that, that would then be the basis of his acceptance. All right. So, you know, you know, acceptance by God will be solely on the basis of the individual's pos position in Christ. You, you might want to believe that or look into that. But n not your own preparation, but the preparation of yourself for the translation. If you're uh, walking around with this partial rapture's nonsense in your head, you, you, have to, you, you have to deny the distinction between Israel and the church. Okay? Uh, you know, and I understand that there are problem passages that have to be dealt with. That's for another time and another video, but uh, there are problem passages. They're just misinterpreted. But you've got to understand God's program for Israel and as well as this program for the church, and distinguish the two as distinctly separate. If you believe in that nonsense, then you have to you have to place a, a, a part of the church in the tribulation period, and this is impossible. One of the purposes of the rapture itself, or, or one of the purposes of the, purposes of the tribulation period, is to judge the world in preparation for the kingdom that follows. The church doesn't need any kind of a purging judgment 
uh, you know, it, I guess it would if the if Christ's work was ineffective, which it isn't. So from these considerations, it, it is it is it is believed that the partial rapture position is untenable. Many many understand that. Uh, you can go over these problem passages. Um, there are uh, there's not that many, but there are some, which at first glance they seem to support the view until you until you you look at them and you find out that they actually don't. You know, so uh, Luke uh, twenty one thirty six. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all those things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Okay? The primary reference, if you take note, in this chapter is to the nation Israel who is already in the tribulation period and therefore this is not applicable to the church. we got to study, folks. All right? The things to be escaped are the judgments associated with that day, okay? That day. That is the day of the Lord. Watchfulness is enjoined upon the church in 1 Thessalonians and in Titus. Uh, apart from being found worthy uh, to participate in the translation. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, which is a common passage, many run to that, you know, concerning, you know, try to read ourselves into that. You know, you got the two women grinding at the, the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Uh, again, this passage is in that discourse in which the Lord outlines his program for Israel, who was already in the tribulation period. Sorry, that dog won't hunt. The one taken is taken to judgment. The one left is left for the millennial blessing. Such is not the prospect for the church. Hebrews 9. I hear it all the time, 928. Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. The phrase unto them that look for him is used here as, as synonymous with believers or the, or the church, quote unquote. Uh, since uh, this attitude constitutes the normal attitude of God's redeemed. Believers are those that look for the Savior, Philippians chapter 3, or anticipate the blessed hope, Titus chapter 2. These who look for him are not contrasted with those who do not look for him in this passage. It simply teaches that as, as he appeared once to put away sin, verse 26, and now appears in heaven for us, verse 24, so that same group, he will again appear, verse 28, to complete the work of redemption. The inference is that the same group to whom he appeared and for whom he now appears will be the one to whom he will appear. And then we have Philippians 3.11, if, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not even close to having anything to do with the rapture. Uh, some hold that Paul was in doubt about his own rapture, if you can believe that. The context does not support that view. Verse 11 looks back to verse 8, where Paul reveals that because of the superior value of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, he gave up all in which he had trusted in that he might win Christ and having found Christ attain unto the out-resurrection of the dead, it's a very unique term, used, never used anywhere but there. It's the resurrection life, here and now, there and now, in his life. Walking on resurrection ground. The new man, new life. Okay. 
the result of winning Christ, not, not the result of preparing himself for the rapture. He, uh, he's, he's revealed the innermost secret of his service, a complete devotion to Christ since he met him on the Damascus Road. And then we have 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You're familiar, I'm sure, every man in his own order. Uh, this, is, uh, this is made by the partial rapturist uh, to teach a division in the ranks of the believer in the resurrection of the church. But you need to take note that Paul is not giving instruction on the order of the resurrection for the church, but rather the divisions or the, or the marching bands within the whole resurrection program. God has a resurrection program, which will include not only church saints, but also Old Testament saints and tribulation saints as well. And then now we're in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. Unto all them also that love his appearing. Okay, that's used by the partial rapturists, you know, to show that the rapture will must be a partial one. However, it's to be noticed that the subject of translation is not in view in this passage, but rather the question of reward. The second advent or second coming was intended by God to be a purifying hope we know that from 1 John chapter 3. And because of such pur purifying, a new life is produced because of the ex expectancy of the Lord's return. Therefore, those that truly love His appearing will experience a new kind of life which will bring a reward. First Thessalonians chapter one verse ten, and to wait for his son from heaven, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And first, first Thessalonians four. Thirteen and eighteen together with First Corinthians fifteen. Are used by the partial rapturist to teach that the church that was unprepared for the rapture will meet the Lord in the clouds on his way to the earth at the second coming. And you got a problem there because that view coincides with the interpretation of the, of the post uh, tribulationist. And so now you got a conflict there and that'll be shown uh, to be contrary to the teaching of scripture so an examination of the scriptures used by the partial rapturists to support their position shows that their interpretation is not consistent with true exegesis and since this view is out of harmony with true doctrine and true exegesis it must be rejected and christians today need to know that their forever home in Christ was never dependent upon anything they ever did. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.